Excellent. Hello, everyone, and good evening. Welcome to the Business of Property. I'm Cheryl, and you're on the Property Development Australia page. And on the Business of Property, we talk about everything property, property um, development. And today's a bit of a, it's a really special session because we have um, Phil Preston here, uh, who's an author, and he has recently launched a book about connecting profit with purpose. Welcome, Phil. Um, welcome to Property Development Australia when, and the business of property. Uh, so, you. Phil, I'm going to read out a little bit of a blurb about you because a few people might be thinking, what social impact, which is probably what we're, we're talking about today, have to do with property development? Um, and I've had quite a bit of interest in this event, so uh, it will be good to really sort of flush out a few, um, a few topics. Uh, that as developers can really think about through our projects. So um, to give everyone a little bit of background, uh, Phil is, here we go, um, Phil joins us to give an insight and an overview of his book and some examples that include property developers and real estate agents. Um, sometimes the opportunities lie in unexpected places. So I'm really keen to find out what that is. Um, Phil, you left the investment management industry mm -hmm. in 2007 uh, to step into the unknown, working with all types of businesses, um, nonprofits, government departments, to devise strategies and facilitate projects that create sustained change at scale um, and you're leading a case study and book author in this you're leading case study and book author in this field um, so what we're going to do here if anyone has partic any particular comments and questions please feel free i think we've got a few here as well hi tony hi jason everyone's saying they're looking forward to it um, and you don't know if i'm really saying <laughs> the right thing or not <laughs> it might be just quick but no um i do know so alex alex is an architect he's very much into sustainable design and all that um and oh we've already got lots of questions um asked and asked if, if right. yes <laughs> if we would be interested in a oh oh someone's asking me if i'm interested in a townhouse development probably not the the, <laughs> the right <laughs> chat to have it in. But let's start. I won't be too distracted with these comments. Really, um, Phil, tell us a little bit more about, I guess, the area of social impact and being able to do, uh, make a difference and connect purpose with profit. Yeah. And I'll have to give you a little bit of the backstory there, which you alluded to. So in my corporate role, I was working with Colonial First State for yep. many years and heading up a research team there. And it was interesting because around that time, 2000, this is 2005, 2006, climate change started becoming you know, more, um, I saw on the front pages and people were talking about responses. And, and not only, I guess, was I personally interested, we had um, investments in our portfolios that, whose values we weren't that sure about. So we could see a connection between what policy might be and the uncertainty around that and, I guess, uncertainty around investment value. But... I guess overriding all this was the sense that when people were asking us, are these good companies we're investing in, really all we seemed to be able to do was to look at their corporate social responsibility statement mm. Um, mm. reports and we'd go, yes, 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 they, they look interesting, they look okay. However, then you'd get these spectacular company collapses or companies would be caught out doing something. And so what it said was, that corporate social responsibility piece is really about brand and reputation. And all businesses have to do that. I'm not saying you don't do that. Mm. However, as we saw with the Banking Royal Commission, it's what's going on in the core of the business that actually counts. It's not what's going on around the edges. So I, you know, I guess when I left the industry, I wasn't disillusioned, but I was just ready to do another thing. And a, about a year or two after I, I did leave and was doing consulting, I came across some principles developed by some Harvard professors and a strategic philanthropist that really made this connection between profit and purpose. And I thought, mm -hmm. wow, well, that's powerful because if CEOs of companies or owners of businesses can see that connection, then they not only want to create purpose or social good, they, want to, they can keep investing in it because it's, it is profitable. And that's a really nice, I think, reinforcing loop. 
And, and I know that the whole sort of um, sustainability, <coughs> oh, excuse me, oh, water, all good, I'm getting too excited. And impact investment space is becoming more and more sort of prevalent and um, popular yeah, for I think people. That, that, that word sustainability for a moment, because I would say, when I was dealing in this space in a corporate context, and as I said, that was about 12, 13 years ago, sustainability was very much applied more as an environmental term. You know, you do um, power saving lights and, or you might um, put in a, a cogeneration plant and that was sustainability. But the other piece around sustainability is sustainable earnings, which is sort of a different conversation. And that sure. I guess social elements as well as environmental. So, so do you, I mean, are you involved much in, I guess, the impact investment space? Because, we, you know, we, we might be talking about property development, but a lot of people, obviously, there's a big part of investing in mm. projects, you know. Um, what is impact investing? Mm. Yeah, good, good question. So impact in investing um, really is seeking to, to generate a commercial rate of return. So in a way, it's sort of like any other investment. It's just that in when you have something that's designated an impact investment, there are some clearer social mm. impact measures. Um, and if you really want to break it down, um, when you when you do something with social advantage, let's say for example, it's it's, it's helping to house um, maybe some homeless people or provide homeless housing. You know, there's outputs, which is you know the number of perhaps accommodation places you're providing. There's outcomes, which is like the medium term results you get. And then there's impacts, which are the long term results. Mm. So um, a lot of, I guess, my work is around helping people understand all these different conversations and what all these different terms mean. And to do that, I have to cover a very wide range of terms. And I yes. don't have the luxury of deep diving into any of them um, in as much detail as I'd like. Sure. But, yeah. But I, I find social impact investing really interesting because about 10 years ago, there were some papers out and they were pretty weak, but now it's, it's getting um, like people grabbing hold of any example that didn't really fit, but they jammed it into that space. But, but now I think it's, it's becoming a more significant area and something that superannuation funds are investing mm. again, because it has, it's aiming at a commercial rate of return. It's not a philanthropic or a, you're not trading off commerciality. Yeah, and I think that's an important point there in terms of that commercial returns because I think, as, as you know, traditionally people think of if it's social impact, if it's sustainability, if it's, I said, for, you know, uh, is that going to mean I have to forsake uh, the high returns which I'm used to? That's right. Um, and and I, it's really good to point out that there's different types of social initiatives that you will be involved in in your business. So there'll, there'll be the ones where you like donating to something or you like um, getting involved in a cause and helping them fundraise. But generally, a lot of those things aren't directly connected to your business. They're things that make you feel good or they help your employees. Uh, perhaps if you've got employees working with you, they help, it helps them feel good. Um, but in a way, those, those types of activities are really good at supporting social causes where there is sort of no market relevance. So if, if we think about Parkinson's disease, for example, as a social issue, if you can fundraise for that, that's great because there's not too many businesses out there that are going to go, oh, we can really benefit by contributing to Parkinson's. You know, it's just that connection doesn't really happen. Whereas a, you know, a social cause that might be around helping young people or disadvantaged youths attain employment in the, say, the construction industry, that would be connected, more connected to the types of businesses you're involved in. Um, so yeah, you have a whole lot of causes that aren't connected and really have no market relevance, and that's great for philanthropy. There's some um, causes you might support because you want to be seen to be doing the right thing as someone in the property space, and but however, they don't really add to your bottom line in any way by supporting. Mm. But then there's the next level, which is where it gets exciting, and it's not necessarily easy to find straight up, but if you can latch on to these innovative ideas that do add to your bottom line, but also help improve some social or environmental cause at the same time, that is, that is where the power is. Yeah. Then you've, you've multiplied your impact. That's right. I'd say yeah. it's an exponential multiplication. That's excellent. So what I'd like to come up with and is for the audience to maybe have some examples yeah. of how it's applicable 
to um, to property. Yeah, and if we can sure. use property development, that's obviously ideal. I'll do my best, and <laughs> I can't I can't promise all these are smack bang in your space. But what I would ask you to take out of it is is the principles that are being used mm. and think how they could be applied to what you're doing. Sure. So I'll, I'll give you a, a sort of a large company example, then a then a small one. So a large one would be the the Stockland business and. Back in, I think, 2004, um, you know, I did interview Matthew Quinn briefly for, for the book. Um, they were faced with the environmental legislation, which meant, I think, that the uh, windows or the insulation they had to put into their new developments was going to be more expensive. And they originally thought about fighting that. But then they thought, OK, no, actually, we can be really good at this and this can be a value add for our investments and we'll try and do this really well. And that led them into, a, I guess, a chain of events which saw them um, end up creating their livability index mm. where they would, um, uh, I guess, sort of try and see that connection between social infrastructure in their residential developments and the prices or returns they were getting for those properties. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the great example is in some cases they would essentially um, drop in a, a school, for example, if that was going to, I, I guess, pay off in terms of increasing the value of that investment instead of that being, I guess, normally something that would happen down the track um, later on in the development cycle. And the reason they would do that is a, a price, but B, government relations and other, I guess, approval times, and there would be a range of, I guess, benefits that would flow out of that. So that's sort of a big end example. Um, mm -hmm. Coming back to something that's more of a, I guess, a social issue, and this is outlined in the book. Um, a, few, a few years ago, I was sharing um i was on a stage and, and a lady was talking before me and she was from western sydney in the macarthur region and that's southwestern sydney and uh she was talking about a real estate agent uh, engagement project so to cut a long story short um it was the all the not-for-profits in southwestern sydney getting together to engage with a group of real estate agents and they were all competing offices so this was like a collaborative approach that was taken and what they were trying to do was to intercept people before they became homeless. So quite often mm. um, when tenants were missing their rent because of ill health or they'd lost their job or there was domestic violence or there was you know, mental health issues and other things going on, they'd go into an eviction process, which you know, they, they'd eventually bounce out of that and more often than not end up in refuges, hostels or couch surfing. So what the idea was that by engaging with the property managers in the real estate offices, they could intercept those people in those situations. And over a two year period, they out of 102 referrals in, um, they saved 57 of those tenancies. Right. So, so the social impact there is you'd say it's pretty large because 57 households or people not going into homelessness is a huge saving for government and a huge benefit. But the real crux to this whole story is not just that social impact piece, the crux of it is um, doing the calculations and figuring out that the agents were saving hard costs of $1,000 every time they averted an eviction process. That's just hard costs. I'm sure there's, um, I guess, some other energy in the office that's also saved. And their clients, the landlords, um, they were saving on average $10,000 um, in terms of what would have been lost rent, remediation costs and reletting costs. So once you, um, and a lot of my work is often talking to businesses of all shapes and sizes and saying, well, what's this issue actually costing you? Because quite often they're not tuned into it. So in that example, they actually started calculating what that cost was, which then led to, I guess, a greater engagement um, in the, <laughs> greater engagement in, in that challenge. <laughs> I've got a little helper who wants it. Wants his teeth teeth brushed. Yeah, at least he's, doing, he's at least he's got good dental hygiene. Um, so in 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 that scenario, and I think that's that's fantastic. That that when you're talking about different organisations that have come together as well, and are working with agents to do so. Oh, hello. Um, were they then uh, where you had these tenants? Were they relocated to? short-term housing and um... uh, well the majority the 57 they saved were able to st stay in their properties so mm. that was a big advantage and so what was happening there was the property manager with the tenant's permission was referring them through uh, it was initially to mission australia mm. who could then triage you know figure out well, okay what's going on with this person 
where do I send them to? Um, quite often they found that there were benefits that people were entitled to that they weren't aware of. Okay. So, so that was an easy win. And quite often the people involved weren't on the books or on, I guess, on the um, radar of the social service provider. So the right. property managers were helping to make that connection. And is that with, with all that's happening now with COVID and, and, you know, a lot of people losing jobs and, um, and although the government's coming in to, to help with, with rentals and all of that, um, is, is that something then that, and I'm not sure if, the, if, if you're, you know, your finger's on the pulse of it, with um, the, the agencies and, and um, landlords should be sort of thinking of working with these organisations uh, to identify well, I think the government's got some legislation in, I believe, and I'm, I, to be honest, I don't know the ins and outs. I, I don't think anyone's going to get evicted in this current environment mm. um, for no, no genuine um, call. Correct. So I guess there's some agreement there. And I guess the challenge here is it's such a systemic issue that it, it's going to back up the whole chain. So if you know the tenant can't pay rent, I guess the, the owner isn't getting their rent and they probably can't service their loan and therefore that impacts mm. the standing and their credit with the bank. Um, look, I'm yeah, struggling to get my head around this, but there is certainly um, a greater need to look at this more as a partnership. Mm. Um, I think if this has done one thing, it's made us realise how petty a lot of the conversations we're having mm. up until now have been because now we're all focused on survival and surviving together, whereas yeah. the previous you know, financial crisis sort of impacted a certain segment of the of society. Um, this is impacting everyone. Yeah. So I believe there's a great spirit of cooperation there. Um, whether things snap back and go back to, we go back to our usual practices in a hurry, I don't think so. Um, I think, um, although I can't make detailed commentary about your industry, I think out of this, there's going to be a lot of government debt to re repay. That'll hold mm. on me back quite a bit. But I think it's also going to raise consumer expectations around, not so much around a, a company's product, but I think about the character of the company. Yeah. Um, so in terms of whether I want to go and work with them or whether I want to deal with them as a customer, I think that character piece is going to become a lot more relevant. Yeah. Um, and sort of going back to uh, if we're talking, I know we talked about supply chain and things like that earlier on before we got on. Yeah. Um, talk me through that and, and what we can consider in our projects um, to have some sort of impact. Yeah, sure. So it, when you're looking for opportunities in this area, and just think of this more as a lens for innovation rather than a just a social stream. You know, you've got mm -hmm. to think in, in both those terms. So the way I would normally look at it is, um, well, for starters, I often ask business owners or executives, you know, what are the, the current strategic challenges for your business? And if they list out five or ten, generally you'll find within that two or three where there is some crossover. So that crossover will look like um, there's a social cost in there that's actually holding back your business. In very simple terms, that, for example, that could be even your employees. Um, there might be things going on in their life that's affecting their ability to show up at work every day or, um, you know, other, other things that are impacting their productivity. And there might be a small investment you can make to help improve that that will pay off mm. you. Mm. Um, if we take it to another level and we think about supply chain, so look at the business partners you work with. Have they got things going on in their business that they need help with or is there something you can do together to help solve some other social um, or envir environmental challenges you see in your realm? Uh, looking out further, there's, there's another piece around what I call um, the ecosystem you operate in. So traditionally in, in large corporate land, for example, they've sort of only looked as far as their supply chain or their value chain. But they're now being, I guess, challenged to look at a bigger range of stakeholders. Um, they have to engage with their customers in new ways, communities in new ways, and now government in new ways. And that's actually a, uh, a bit of a scary process. And um, some really large companies at a forum I was at um, last year, you know, were saying, uh, these are some of the biggest food brands are saying, look, we know this is the way we have to go, but we really don't know how to do it as yet. Mm. We're still mm. finding our way. And I suspect a lot of industries might be in the same boat. I guess what I love about your industry is it is pretty tangible. So you can normally see 
uh, where the opportunities might be. Hopefully. Yes. Well, well, there's there's a big, um, you know, at, at the moment. So I, I you know, for myself, for example, we focus a lot on the co living space. So providing affordable rentals and things like that. We don't deal in sort of the the NDIS realm, which I also know um, a, a lot of colleagues do. And then that, I think that for most people in their heads is what they would identify as having some sort of, you know, social impact um, and, and might invest in it and, you know, consider it impact investing type. Um, so it's more looking at the, the, the traditional type of, of projects and, and seeing opportunities where um, developers, like you said, even if it's not the end product, um, <clears throat> looking at, at that process of whether leading up to the development or, or after that, like you said, contributing, um, you know, uh, charities or things like that, which I think you said might not necessarily be directly related. Um, I'll share one one charity which I really uh, that we support, which is um, called Homes for Homes, which is for um, homeless and and I think they partner up with developers, where I think it's like a point zero one percent of the sales price is contributed to um, gets donated to homes for homes and that's actually written into uh, the contract um, and I believe that it follows on for the rest of the the property's life until someone takes it out of the the contract so it's things like that where I think we as developers can think a little bit more create creatively uh, to work out how how well, we can and I, and I don't know that in, in detail <clears throat> but I guess um, yeah there might be opportunities to actually gain insights from being part of that process to to identify other issues or challenges that you see um, as I said basically the three types of opportunities will be one to, to save costs somehow and the yeah. real estate example even though it wasn't property development per se that was an example where the agents and the clients were saving money the second example is where you use this for product innovation and the Stockland example or, you know, having some features that um, it creates a competitive advantage in terms of a new product or new market feature. Mm -hmm. And the third type is one you alluded to is, is what's what the real estate agents did themselves was collaborate to help improve the conditions either in their industry or region. So they, they are typically, um, I, I guess, the, the three lenses you'd be looking towards. So you can come at this um, as a business. You can think about, okay, what's going on for me? For example, mm. if you've got a certain target market in mind that you're currently not, not involved with, but it's something you see you want to be going towards in the future, perhaps there's a, a, an issue that connects somehow to that market that will help give you a way in, um, a way in to maybe uh, come in with a differentiated product. Because um, if, if you step back a little bit, um, and uh, one of the, big pharmaceutical uh, bosses um, said this a while back. He was saying it's, it's relatively easy to copy a product, but it's not so easy to copy the relationships that go with a, a new business model mm. like that. So, you know, there is some um, scope there to get a, an edge on your competitors, but there's also scope to work collaboratively to, to, to have a rising tide um, for everyone in the industry. And how much are you seeing there being more of a change of um, uh, of consumers looking for that that impact and choosing one over the other? Yeah, I think consumers are coming along um, fairly slowly because it's a difficult conversation to have. Mm -hmm. I know if I'd heard this word impact um, 15 years ago, I wouldn't have had a clue what it meant. Um, so... But I think with the advent of social media and a lot of other tools and easy to, it's easy to research these things, a lot more people are getting up to speed with it. I think what will be interesting is um, if we think about, say, um, you know, they talk about the brightest young graduates coming out of university and the best companies trying to move them up. And these graduates are looking for companies with the social conscience. Mm. And, you know, to date with the sort of tech company successes, they have been looking for the companies that, um, donate one percent of their profits to a cause, or give them, you know, one day or two days a year off to go and do something. 
well, I think that's all great. I wouldn't say don't do that, but the whole industry is doing it. So mm. it's not really a competitive advantage for anyone. Mm. I think they'll be looking for the company with the real test of character and purpose that, that really identify, that they identify with as a whole. Um, you know, if, again, if I go back 10 or 15 years, the idea of purpose, and you talked about, you know, what is our company's mission or our purpose, it was very much um, something you would do on an offsite once a year and you'd say, oh, this is what it is. You'd go back to work and then ignore it again for another 12 months. Yeah. You know, but we, we've definitely evolved in the last um, 10 or 15 years in thinking about purpose as a strategic weapon. Um, a good local example is the insurance company IAG, um, which has the purpose of making your world a safer place. Mm. Now, it's in a lot of different insurance markets. You'll notice how that purpose doesn't actually say anything about insurance. So it gives them the scope to play in sort of adjacent markets and potentially innovate in new areas, um, you know, by, by virtue of that remit. And I think, again, this comes back to the post-COVID world where everyone's going to be pretty tight with, with money. Everyone wants to get value for money. Governments don't have as much money to spend supporting and propping up people. They would love the private sector to be doing more of the heavy lifting for them. Yeah. So if, if government can help, uh, I guess, bring and facilitate people coming together with bright ideas to work um, companies with not-for-profits and really being focused around a true purpose rather than what they can just sell, um, then that's, that I think is going to be powerful to for the company's character. So is it something in terms of purpose and impact, uh, is it something that's easy it would seem to me something that's not so easy to really measure. Yeah, measurement's always the, the interesting one. And in the examples I've given, for example, the real estate agent one, you know, part of the goal in that is having some metrics around it to be able to say, mm. uh, we've saved this many um, tenancies and it's saved this many dollars. Um, now, I wouldn't say you have to have perfect measurement to, before you do these things. A lot of people balk at because they don't have perfect measurement. I was like, well, you know, you can actually spend hundred thousand dollars measuring some of these things, and they're all based on assumptions anyway. Mm. And there's a level of intuition, um, and you can come up with a set of proxy indicators that will be will be near enough. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, don't get too weighed down by that. But by all means, you need to go into it with some measurement in mind. Again, if I go back uh, about six years ago, talking to um, some very large companies about this and say, okay, what are your social initiatives? And they tell me this, this, and this. And they're, they're actually fairly clear on the social impact, but they were not at all clear on the business benefit. Yeah. And yeah. so the conversation would be, okay, so tell me how that adds value to your business. Hmm. And they say, oh, well, people see we're helping someone, they think we're good blokes and they'll buy more of our products. Okay, well, if that's your hypothesis, how do you actually, can you show me that link? And then they sort of go, oh, no, that's, that's a bit hard. We haven't really thought about that. So we're, mm. a lot of this conversation is about, I guess, bringing both those things together because, um, again, in a large business context, you have your sustainability or corporate social responsibility team who are very embedded in this in social and environmental benefit side. And then you have the business that's, I guess, thinking, you know, the core business is just thinking about profit and loss. And it's really creating that joint conversation. And that, that's a challenge because it takes people into new zones and, um, it is quite exciting to facilitate those conversations because sometimes yeah. you, get, you get into a forum where, you know, the penny just drops and, and everyone goes silent and they've latched onto an idea and, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing to behold. Yeah, I think it's, it's something in, in terms of our community in the property space. Uh, uh, we've got some, some pretty big problems in, in, in certain communities where it's to do with, like you said, the homelessness yeah. or um, in, in low socioeconomic areas. I know um, David Ng from our, our community, he's putting together uh, community homes. So that's, that's his business. Um, but he's had to deal with a lot of like, uh, people that have issues with drugs and alcohol and, and all of that. Um, and I think um, it is something in our space which I would like to be able for us to see and probably have facilitate how we can in each of our projects have some sort of, you know, good that comes out of it. Yeah. Um, that it's not, not just because, because everyone looks at property development and they go, oh no, it's just all money making, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, right. And that, that situation you mentioned, I think is, is a great one, particularly if you're talking about commercial development or retail spaces or shopping malls. Mm. You know, have, having 
seeing that there's issues there, which might be, say, drug and alcohol related and, and other challenges. And there's a lot of entwined issues there. It's not just one thing. Um, you don't so solve homelessness by giving someone a home necessarily. There's a lot mm. of stuff going on that needs mm. support. But if you can work in with um, you know, effectively with local government, social support providers and potentially other businesses in the area and find out can you actually help change that dynamic mm. and you can potentially improve the value of your asset as a result of that. Yeah. You can improve, you know, the, the general environment, people are going to shop more clearly and valuations will rise. Now, this comes with a little bit of a, a mindset caveat that it's not going to happen overnight. Mm. So we really need to have a mindset here that can take, you know, months, potentially years um, to get some of these things right. Um, so let's not go into, into this with any illusions, but there are shorter term um, strategies and wins to be found as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'd like to hear a little bit more um, about, I guess, uh, we've got this book out that you've just, just written and I'm keen to understand um, and for yeah, the I'll, audience. I'll, 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 oh, that one, you've got one, one handy there. Yeah, um, yeah. What, what can we expect to find find from the book okay so the idea of the book was to help um i guess make that bridge between what is uh i guess a lot of people in this who do work in this space just go into so much depth you can't understand what they're saying and mm. then there's a i guess a whole group that don't know how to get into the conversation so i'm trying to create that that bridge between the two by using a lot of storytelling and a lot of case studies to show what these yes. um, the principles are we're applying here so the, the book does four key things it looks at what we've already tried, such as philanthropy and, and brand and reputation mm. um, programs. And I'm not saying they're wrong, but just saying they've had limited impact. Um, it also unpacks a couple of things like what is impact investing and, and so on, so that people understand what they are. Um, in section two, I go into you know, what these principles are and how they can give you a competitive advantage by way of many examples. And then we break that down a bit. Um, but then section three is sort of saying, well, how do you do this yourself in your own business? And there's five different entry points for doing it. So I did mention one, you just write down all the things impacting your business and see where the overlaps are in terms of social challenges or environmental issues. That's one way. Um, the book has five different um, methods for approaching this because it is innovation. You can't guarantee mm -hmm. it'll work. But the, if you have a process around it, you generally latch on to the right things. And the fourth piece is really just creating that action item. And, um, you know, I don't want people coming out of a book like this going, oh, wow, this is big. It's, it's all too hard. Yeah. Yeah. What is that next step? And that next step quite often can be as simple as just going out and having a conversation with someone you wouldn't normally talk to. Or maybe going to that conference because it's in a different sector, um, you know, you Maybe you wouldn't ordinarily go to that. Not that we go to conferences in person right now. Yeah. But, um, you know, as an example, I've worked with a lot of um, government clients and they never would have thought of going to a property development conference, for example. Yes. You know, so why, you know, if we have some of that flow going, uh, you, you've really got to step out of your comfort zone a little bit to sometimes hear the conversations. Um, and, and the book actually goes through um, some work I did in the regional area of Wagga Wagga in New South Wales, mm -hmm. where it was bringing together large business with social housing and social support mm. providers and government, state government. And, you know, it was, it was fantastic to build that conversation and that project's been very successful in terms of getting disadvantaged and unemployed youths into employment. Um, but, you know, that whole process meant a lot of people had to step outside their comfort zone. Um, and I did, just to finish off on that one, the, the real, I think, gold in, in that and what was able to be done down there was the fact we didn't have to get a whole lot of grant funding from government or anyone to do it yeah we relied on very minimal funding and we we're just coordinating existing resources or existing organizations in a much smarter way so yeah that's that's the sort of beauty of collaborative approaches quite often you can see ideas and it's just trying to bring them together in the right way yeah that's wonderful and i think you know phil i think this is a it's it's definitely a topic that I'm, I'm particularly passionate about um, and, and I'd like to be able to continue this, and particularly in this space, uh, in this particular industry where we can give um, our community and other developers some clear, uh, you know, not necessarily clear, but some guidance mm -hmm. as to here. These are the factors that you can probably consider in your whole process 
um, if you haven't already. And if you do want to be able to, to, to make some sort of impact and, and pull together that sense of purpose. Um, so Phil, how can we, if anyone's interested, um, we've got ooh, a special code there. That just oh, there we go. We've got the great. website. Um, got that so all sorted. If you want the physical book, you jump onto my website and there's a code special 20, which will knock it down $5 from 29 95 to 24 95. Um, if you go through Amazon and other um, avenues, that's fine too, but um, I can't apply the code to them. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if you're interested in this and want to learn more, and I hope you do, it'd be great. It'd be great to be here in a couple of years mm. time with a whole lot of property development examples, because in most industries, that's what you need. You need a couple of leaders to, to be able to, I guess, put out a case study um, or be willing to be part of a case study. And that can actually be challenging or confronting mm. for some people. Um, and part of the challenge here is it's not to actually talk about the business benefits in this process. Mm. There's a reluctance to say, you don't go out saying I profited from someone's you know, poor circumstance, but if, if I can improve my business and at the same time improve you or mm. some group of people, then that win-win is something we've got to perpetuate. And, and that's the bit I love capturing. So I'd love to have more examples from your industry over time and, and keep building on this um, body of work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm thinking already in my head, like, you know, if we, we have some sort of, um, not task force, like a focus group type where, where there are a few developers in, in the community who are keen to explore in their projects what to do, um, I know, I know I would, I know uh, there are a few other people here, I said, very, very strong advocates of um, social good and sustainability to be able to come together and, and, and do a big sort of mastermind of, you know, how can we help contribute and improve, you know, the industry and our product. That's right. And I've already, well. I spoke to you and, and one other person in your network who had doing some fantastic things already. And it's really just saying, okay, maybe there's a little tweak to that that could just yes. up another level again and yeah again in some of those conversations you, you sometimes you plant an idea and you just see people's brains going around and it's it's nice yeah. to capture that process yeah and we go through i mean I, I see what goes through um the group every day and we are sometimes we we are sort of got our little blinkers on where we're like okay we've got to get this project right we've got to make sure you know the fact there's so many uh, complexities that come along with development that if, if if we don't realise it, that that whole social side of things does get a little bit lost in the process. Um, so I think it is good for us to to continually remind and have something in place where we can say, "Hey, there are some steps." By the way, have you thought of thought of this? And, and, and is potentially something that we have that conversation with councils to be able to say that. Yeah, like, and I think there are some very very good councils. I know Melbourne um, and Victoria, a lot of councils there already implementing sustainability factors and and um in new south wales you know uh, affordable housing um measures and percentage of housing in development um i think there are some flaws to that um uh, in my opinion but i think they are trying to do something there so yeah. uh, like you said it's not going to happen overnight and particularly if you're, you're dealing with government mm -hmm. again a lot of complexities there and it's going to be slow as a wet, wet wick, but we've got to, as the developers, do something proactive. Yeah, from that. I've found through my work with New South Wales government in particular, there's a real, once they hear about the model where it's less about us funding and more about yeah. you doing, they yes. get pretty excited pretty quickly about that. Correct. It does, it's certainly, you know, sometimes from the starting point today, it requires people having different conversations to what they've had in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm going to have a look to see if there are any comments here. I know there are uh, a few kudos there. Um, Tony says, great and understandable approach. Thank you. Um, David Ung, who I mentioned before, uh, who's putting together community homes. Um, he says, thanks for the intro. Uh, Alex is an architect. And he says, that's a great point. I think we were talking about um, uh, weighing not weighing out, having to balance um, impact investing and returns. And he says, from a designer's point of view, oh, you're lost. Oh, buying the book right now. Here we go. <laughs> so we've done, we've done the right thing. I've lost your, your comment, Alex. Oh, where is it Can I add something in for Alex there? Because if yes. you're a professional services provider, um, you know, 
similar to say accountants, lawyers and so on, sometimes you're not the one who's doing the big thing, but you can see how other people can, can do mm. the big thing. Um, mm. I think that's a really exciting place to be in. And it gives you an opportunity to create a stronger partnership with your clients as well. If you can help yeah. into this space too. Yeah. And, and um, I feel that a lot of people previously have been a little bit apprehensive about um, expressing their purpose because I said having that that concept of the big you know money grabbing developer uh, people are a lot more wanting to be able to see uh, and connect with what is your your purpose and particularly if you're looking at invest investments and investors in this space uh, I'm finding a lot more people are going hey if I can get commercial returns but this is a project that's giving back in some way of course I'm going to look at this particular project? Well, I'd, I'd say just from my old investment hat, if you're a superannuation fund, you're looking for large scale investments in this space. So a single small development is, isn't going to do it for you because you've got a very large pot of money to invest. But if someone's out there with a good reputation who can keep doing something great over and over again, hmm. then that becomes a very attract, attractive proposition. And, you know, if you're the person doing that thing, it, it can be great commercial advantage for you as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Phil. I said I sure. found that extremely, extremely interesting, and I, I love the topic um, because I think we should definitely be doing more uh, in what what we do in in our industry and in our community. Um, stay well. I just want to let everyone know, just because I'm so excited that uh, that Phil Phil ran a marathon on the weekend, but he did it all within social distancing measures. <laughs> <laughs> Running, I'm not sure. Would it have been about about 46 like 50, laps? 50, I was going to say 50. Yeah. 46 laps in a figure eight um, <laughs> loop. <laughs> with my son, with my son and with my son. Son. So yeah, we yeah. had. We, we, and, we started out pretty good, but I was feeling pretty shattered towards the end. <laughs> and you're getting a bit bored with the, um, with the. I was going to say with the view, with the continual view. Uh, yeah. But well done, uh, well done with the book as well, Phil. Um, it's great to be able to see um, that whole idea of being able to connect profit with purpose because uh, it can can absolutely happen. Thanks for your interest. Um, and and thanks for inviting me on here tonight. It's been great. No, you're, you're very welcome. Um, feel free to hop on to the Facebook page and there will be comments there. So if there's any anyone you, um, that's reaching out to you and might have questions, feel free to obviously respond on the page. Um, David's just finishing off and he says, getting funding is a bit of a challenge uh, for community homes. Um, so sometimes in terms of whether it's, more sort of the social housing and things like that. Um, and it's not a space that, that I'm deeply involved in. It's, for us, it's, it's also the funding side of things um, and investment. So yep. thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll have to co continue, <coughs> excuse me, to be able to, as I said, um, make it more mainstream. For sure. Just surviving that. <laughs> Surviving, just <laughs> excuse you, me. Where you hit the record stop button. Oh, good. Thanks, everyone. Thank you again, Phil. We'll see you again and um, stay safe and be healthy, everyone. Ciao. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.